you will reflect, that you will encourage us with your scriptures. Give us light, give us encouragement, and help us to hear the word from the Master instead of the words of sin. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we thank you. Amen. Amen. So today we will read from um, Psalm chapter 42. It is wonderful to hear the sound of scripture being turned. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears has been my food and day and night. For well, they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember. And I poured out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the tongue and lead them in procession to the house of God. With a voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you in despair of my soul? Why have you become disturbed within me? Hoping God. For I shall again praise Him. For the, prep, for the help of His presence. O oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and the peaks of Hermon and Mount Mitzah. Deep calls to deep. At the sound of your waterfalls, all your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and His song will be with me in the night. A prayer to God, the God of my life. And I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As the shattering of my bones and my adversaries revealed me, while well, they say to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hoping God, for I shall yet praise Him, the help of my countenance and my God. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> so this morning, from this passage, we will be reflecting on how do we go through difficult times. Hard times, we have all been through them. On occasions, the weight of life just lands unannounced on our lap, and we wonder, do I have enough internal resolve to get through this difficult patch? Or you may have uttered this prayer during your seasons of doubt. And it sounded much like what the psalmist's heart cry is in Psalm 42. No more, Lord. No more. I can scarcely handle any more excruciating circumstances. My tears and my pain are my only companion. And I want to believe that you are here with me. But it seems so difficult to trust Lord, your silence is so deafening. And you convinced yourself, if one more bad news were to fall on me, I don't know if I can ever recover. What do you do? What do you do when disappointments come crushing one after another unto you? The wisdom writer in Proverbs 13, 12, Proverbs 13, 12 says this, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. We all have hope. So Hope for a better future. Hope for a better relationship. Maybe with your spouse. 
maybe with your child, maybe with your parents, maybe with your friend, maybe a better prospects, a better job, a better education, a better house. Or maybe you hope for a better relationship with your loved one that has gone home to be with the Lord. There's no way it is possible to reconcile those relationships. We all become elated when our hopes become a reality. Hope carries tremendous power. Hope paints the picture in our hearts and in our mind. Today will be better. There will be a brighter future. Hope brings excitement. How many of you, when you are planning for a holiday trip, you get excited? Or how many of you get groomy when you plan for a holiday trip? Almost none, right? Hope brings tremendous uh, excitement. And yet, for the people of faith, hope can be a very, very dangerous thing. As life happens, some of us just find ourselves in hard places again and again. And again, the hope that we dream of, why is it that instead of a better future, problems keep coming our way? Why is it that instead of a satisfying relationship, we find ourselves fighting Maybe with the very ones that you love, like your spouse, your kid, or your parents. And when we do not receive what we have hoped for, for too long, the baggage of disappointment, sorrows, and pain, along with the difficulty of having to master in another ounce of energy to hope against hope, it seems too much to us of us. Some will even tell ourselves, maybe we shouldn't have hoped too much. Maybe after all, if we do not hope, that we will not raise our expectations and our desire or expectation for God to act on our behalf. And so if we do fall, or if disappointment do come, then maybe we will not feel so devastated. Perhaps life and all its attending pain will become much bearable if we do not have expectations. It is one thing to be disappointed in people in friends, in family. It is another thing to be disappointed in God. After all, humans are limited and we all can rationalize that. We are fallen, we are imperfect, we cannot help ourselves. But God, the all-powerful and the almighty God, we know that if God does not act on our behalf, what can man do? The inferior, the inferior ones surely do not have the capacity to twist the arm of God as if God is on our back and call to do whatever we wish and we desire. And yet at the same time, nearly many of our prayers, we try to twist the arm of God. The exilic prophet Isaiah reminds us that we are clay and God is the potter. And the clay has no right to tell to the potter how we are to be shaped. And so today, as we think about the difficult seasons that we go through in life, let's go to the psalmist for guidance. The psalm we read in Psalm 42, but Psalms 42 and Psalm 43, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, originally were printed as one psalm in the Hebrew text. The psalm is written by a Jew who missed his homeland. 他思想了他的故乡，没有机会回到他的故乱。而在思想的过程当中，他想到了在以色列国的那个地方去敬拜神的的的的一系列的活动。And and he missed the liturgical life and the procession in the Holy Land. Participation in the holy activity in the Holy Land is a big deal in Israelite culture. Participation in the liturgical worship speaks. Sacramentally of God's promise and God's faithfulness to them. After all, it was God who spoke to David to, to, to have those range of procession in the temple of God. And God says that though I will not um, uh, live uh, and, and dwell in the house that is built by man, but God chose uh, that through the lineage of David and the temple that Solomon built, that God's worship, that God will receive man's worship. However, the Israelites now live in exiles in a foreign land and they can only look back to a former life. The passage is not sufficiently clear as to whether this passage occurred in a time when these migrants were experiencing uh, exile in the Babylonian times or the Egyptian exile or during the Persian exile. But this much we know. 
We know that the people of God miss their home. They long to experience the worship of God in their motherland. And in fact, the passage repeatedly tells us that not only did the writer have to console himself, but also that the writer had to deal with the taunting questions by those who live amongst them in the foreign land. Where is your God? We, we read that several times in this passage. The question, where is your God, is not a casual statement about the Jewish religion or inquiring about the Jewish faith. The tone is one of skepticism. When was, when was the last time that you shared your experience of God with a colleague, perhaps with a neighbor, and they look at you with such disbelief? As, and if you were to put words to their expression and their looks, it would probably sound something like this. You must be nuts to believe that God can do miracles. Uh, sometime, some years ago, probably in 1996, 97, 1997, I was sharing my faith with a university professor at the National University of Singapore. Uh, and he was a business professor. And he looked at me and said, Tim, really? Do you still believe in those medieval superstitious stuff? Now, I did not get from the conversation that he was being uh, skeptical or being sinistic. Uh, but, but I felt that he was very sincere in his probing. And the probing hides behind a, a, a question. And the question was a deep mistrust in religion. It sounded really sincere. And, but yet at the same time, behind the sincerity of those questions, where is your God? It's a rhetoric of, of contravening the questions that are raised by the people of faith. The, the question that the people of faith have raised in order to persuade others to faith. He did not trust those questions. And he reasoned that in the age of science and technology, where science and medicine could resolve nearly or most of the complicated problems that we have in life, there is no need for God. Or the question of God talk is either uh, a, a, a myth or it is a, a set of questions that are perpetuated by people who are ignorant. So the professor will talk. But yet, in, in the midst of this story, we get a very different picture uh, that the children of Israel were going through. The children of Israel are very proud of their, their faith. And, and, and so they will be circulating stories and stories of God's miraculous acts uh, in the foreign land that they lived in. God opening the Red Sea. God protecting the children of Israel against the attacks of the foreigners. God promising that David will not lack a successor to his throne, the lineage, as well as the liturgical procession of the worship of God, the worship of Yahweh, which speaks of the faithfulness of God to his chosen people. After all, these are the chosen people, and God has singled them out and made them his. There is no indication to the Jews in the exile that they have forgotten their culture. So you would imagine that the Jews must be chattering amongst themselves and not just chattering among themselves in a foreign land when they are migrants, but they were also there talking to the Babylonians, to the Egyptians, to the Persians, whichever exile they are in. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in my God? My God is mighty. He can do this, He can do this, He can do this, and He has done this, He has done this, and He has done, done this. So there was all this chattering around. And yet, God seems far away. The reality was a different scenario. It was a different picture. The kingdom of David and Solomon uh, were divided after Jeroboam and Sor uh, Rehoboam. We talked about that last, two weeks ago, I believe. And sometime later, the kingdom of Israel was wiped out and only the kingdom of Judah remained. And God seemed to have forgotten His promise. So the taunting question, where is your God? carries a skeptical and cynical tone of disbelief that no one in difficult times will really want to hear. No one in disappointment will, will like someone to, 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 to pour cold waters on you, pour in the lung, so you tell you, oh, you sing the song, no, 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 no. We don't like to hear that when we are in difficult times. And yet, the, with the psalmist, when life hits at its hardest, we, they are not, he was not really mad with the taunting question about his faith, but he was met with something that is more difficult to bear. And that was the silence of God. The divine silence. Divine silence can be one of the most frustrating experiences in a believer's journey. 
divine silence prompts a believer to question, is God for me? Why does God choose not to act even when we know that in all His sovereignty and His might and His power and His omnipotence, Abba could have easily lifted one finger and resolved our predicaments? What does God's passivity mean in that situation? Divine silence forces us who have been waiting patiently upon God to act, to acknowledge squarely our disappointment. Our disappointment not with any other folk, but with God. And in the process, we have to reconcile with the crux of discipleship. Do I trust? Or do I not trust? 我要信赖神吗? 当神没有向我说话的时候, 当神很宁静很宁静的时候, 在我最危... 在我遇到最危机、最困难的时候，为什么神你有那样大的能力，而你却不彰显你的能力，而却是静静的、静静的，让我在等候。那个时候我在思考，我是否要信赖神？The <coughs> analogy of God's silence is like the meeting of a spouse or a close friend who decides to give you for some reason the silent treatment. 你们有没有,有没有,那个冷战的那个经验,有没有? When you are faced with silent treatment, you have to, you are left wondering, Why is he or she giving me the silent treatment? What did I do to deserve this? What did I do wrong? And can I redeem the situation? Silent treatment from an intimate loved one or intimate friend is very toxic. It is full of feelings. Now, compare the silent treatment from an intimate friend and a loved one to the silent treatment from a stranger and an onlooker. Sure, the silent treatment of an onlooker or a stranger means nothing to us and his or her apathy does not hurt us. But the silent treatment of an endeared one, oh gosh, it is hard to bear. Why? Because we care, we care so much, and the decision to be silent kills intimacy. Sometimes we find resolution. Sometimes the mystery of a broken relationship continues to remain a mystery even after many years. So we ask, in the silence of God, is God trying to kill the intimacy with God? Contrary to our understanding that God seeks intimacy with us, so it is likely for us to imagine that the disciple who wrote Psalm 22 must have been struggling with a range of emotions, just like the spouse who was given silent treatment at the question that she or he had raised. The emotions must have been bottled up deep inside the soul, and to make matters worse, the liturgist missed home, his motherland. And living in a foreign land brings the added challenge of having to adapt to a new culture uh, and, and, and strange mannerisms and strange ways of doing things. And as creatures of habit and comfort, we do not like change. And when we do not like change, when we have to change in the midst of hardship, it makes things even more challenging. So you can only imagine the struggles that the Jewish migrants must have had in a foreign land. If participating in worship in the motherland signifies God's faithfulness, then the inability to return home to the temple to worship God could have only made it more depressing for the exiled Jews. And yet, taunting your faith could not have been more severe blow to this one blow when God seems silent and distant. And where are you, God, in the midst of this? How does one persist in faith when evidences point to either an auto-distant God who does not seem to care, or if God cares, then Abba's action does not seem to line up with our theology and our experience of who God is in difficult times. To be sure, many of us in this room must have had experiences when the nearness of God was our companion. Those of us who have, been, who have the born-again experience and who have personally experienced God's love and protection are convinced that our spiritual encounters must not have been our imagination. And so we believe the Holy Spirit has convicted us and has led us to truth, has indwelled us and, have, and with the certainty of faith given us hope even though we have many unanswered questions. 
We know at least this much, that our doctrine of God teaches that God actively reveals God's love and God's self to mankind, and one sovereign act of revelation could shatter every doubt, and, or at least bring some comfort and clarity to our confusion and our pain. And so we thought. And so to contrast the faith and doubt, and to contrast the mystery of God's revelation and the mystery of God's silence, cannot be more difficult to comprehend when we needed God to act the most in our situation. If there is a time when life was at its lowest and when we know that God's revelation could break through our darkness, this has to be it. And so we know that God who created the galaxies and the universe can move mountains. And so we tell ourselves, God who can do all things, surely nothing is too difficult for God to act. And God who possesses infinite wisdom and surely would have every answer for every complexities of life. Oh, God could permanently silence the most aggressive doubter and antagonizers of the faith. But God did not come to our aid. Or so it seems. Or so that's how the psalmist felt. Can you feel that as I paint this picture for you, can you feel what the psalmist must have felt at the time of his or her prolonged waiting before the presence of God? Can you imagine how the liturgist was coping with this disappointment? The only companion to the psalmist were the tears, Scripture tells us, were the tears that flow day and night from a sorrowful heart. And through the tears and the recorded words, we see the psalmist's journey culminating in prayer, in a crying out to God with such sorrow and pain that words could barely describe what was going on in the soul. Just like a lot of times when we are going through sorrow of, of a broken relationship or a loved one that has gone home, that words failed us to articulate that. And when we go before the presence of God, sometimes we can only be so quiet before Him because no words can come out. Every form of word that comes out fails to express the depth that is in the soul. So basically, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, we saw the psalmist pouring out his lament before God. And scriptures record also a range of other experiences of those who were disappointed and those who sought God in their sorrow. We have Job. Nearly two-thirds of Job was talking about Job pouring out his sorrow both before God and before his friends. And thankfully, his friends were not any helpful anyway. Uh, and then we also have lamentations. We also have Samuel. In the cries, we hear an intense longing for God. The longing not just to return to motherland. The longing uh, is a desire for the divine presence in the holy land to participate in the procession of worshipping God in Jerusalem. Now compare that experience that the psalmist have in Psalm 42 with our experience. How many of you, when you were disappointed, no, no, don't raise, don't raise your hand, okay? How many of you, when you were disappointed with God, the first question you want to, that, you, that you have in your heart is, I want to get back at God, I'm not going to church this Sunday. I'm not going to this Bible school, I'm not going to this, this activity in church. We, we, we pour our resent before God in very different ways from how the psalmist dealt with his disappointment before God. Amidst the taunting words and the skeptic of God's absence, the faithful, we were told in Psalm 42, refused to give up hope. So the psalmist recorded this beautiful heart cry before God, and through the psalm, we see the psalmist making an internal adjustment. We are to duck the or the more. So here's what we learn from the psalmist. The psalmist encouraged himself to hope in Yahweh. The, what, what the psalmist performed is what psychology today would call self-talk. Think about verse 5 and verse 11. Why are you despair, O oh my soul? Why have you become disturbed within you? 
Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Notice the use of the you and the, the me. It is not talking about two different people. He's not talking to someone else. He's speaking to his own soul. He's speaking to his own soul. He's speaking to his own soul. He's speaking to his own he encouraged himself in the Lord. The second thing we learn from the psalmist is that the psalmist pleaded with God. In verse 6, he says, Oh my God, my soul is in despair. You are the psalmist plead was not just a plea, but in the plea that the psalmist gave before God, the psalmist recalled before the presence of God the times of God's faithfulness and the times of God's might. And he says, Therefore, I will remember you from the land of Jordan and the peak of Hermon and Mitzah. Deep calls to thee. The sound of your waterfalls and all your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. So when we say the, the land of Jordan so looking at those range of mountains, the, the three mountains that were highlighted, they were not really the highest, but they were some of the higher mountains in the land. Uh, and, and it was a reflection, a testimony of the faithfulness and the goodness and the power of God. Recalling the times past that in those mountains, in those plots that they have went, that they saw the faithfulness of God. So maybe some of you may have traveled from Austin uh, to uh, Virginia Beach. Some of you might have traveled from Taiwan to uh, Virginia Beach. Some of you were in Dallas. Some of you were in Chicago uh, or on Washington, D.C. And in those difficult seasons of your life, you met God there. And in your prayers of dejection, you went to God and you recalled those moments and those seasons and say, God, you were with me in Washington, D.C. You were with me through those difficult seasons in Taiwan. You were with me during those difficult seasons in New York and San Francisco. Lord, so now I implore you again. The psalmist prayed before God, recalling God's mind and power. Basically, what we saw the psalmist did in the range that we read in 42 was the psalmist gathered his hope in God when God was silent. So in verse 5 and in verse 11, it says, <coughs> Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him for the help of His presence. Hope in God, so when we go through difficult season, like the psalmist said, God was silent, he hoped in God. He believed that God is absolutely trustworthy. So, so the psalmist went on in verse 8 and said, The Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and His song will be with me in the night. Now, now think about it for a moment. Was the Lord giving loving kindness in the daytime? Was the Lord giving a song in the night? No, the Lord was not that the Lord was silent and it was absent. It was the psalmist who told himself, in the daytime, I will look out for the loving kindness of God. Just like the song that we sang earlier, that I will bless the Lord. Ten thousand reasons I will find. How many reasons can we find to praise God in our difficult season? Will we find 10,000 reasons in the daytime and in the night when, when things are dark and, 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 and when there is no light, we, we are feeling gloomy on the inside and the psalmist say, my song of praise before the Lord I will utter in the night. 
even though the Lord was silent. So we know that the Lord was silent and it was the psalmist's struggle because in verse 8, we see the psalmist says, this is a prayer to the God of my life. So even though the psalmist couldn't return to habitual worship in the motherland, we find here that he was worshipping God. We find here that the psalmist recognized this transitory moment as God's discipline to bring the worshipper to the end of himself and herself so that they may turn away from trusting things, turn away from trusting people, turn away from trusting situations. Or maybe if my boss would have been kinder, things would have been a whole lot easier. Or maybe if my wife were to neaten things up, it would be a whole lot easier. Maybe if my husband don't complain so much, it would have been easier. But, but the psalmist experience the discipline of God that through those seasons of God's silence, the psalmist has to learn, no, it is not in the people. It is not in the circumstances. Circumstances will always be bad because we live in an imperfect world and we are imperfect ourselves. So my hope is not on things, not on people, not on circumstances, not on this better job, this better car, this better situation, but in God. Because it is God that will turn my heart. So that my trust eventually will not be on any of these things, but it will be solely on God. So in your darkest hours, the message of Psalm 42 teaches, and let us conclude with this. The message of Psalm 42 teaches, encourage yourselves. Hope in God, no matter how hopeless your circumstances will be in. Recall God's faithfulness in the past, because the memory has a way of helping us to build trust again. And cried out to God, do not shun Abba, instead return to intimacy with Him. Do not avoid coming to the church because just because we were angry with God. And when you pray in that season of the dark night of the soul, know this, that your end, your end is just the beginning to the miracle of hope that only God Thank you. Let me say again. Your end is just the beginning to the miracle of hope that only God so as, as we come towards the end of this message and thinking about the journeys of hardship that the psalmist have went through and thinking about our individual hardship, I want to conclude with a hymn. And the hymn was uh, written in, in the 1970s by, by a French uh, writer, uh, Ellen Burgess, well, uh, and uh, Claudia Fretzi. Uh, and it was written by the Reformed Church uh, in France. And uh, it is uh, translated uh, as uh, 我心切切可慕你, uh, My Living Sacrifice. And, and in uh, a lot of Chinese churches, when they sang this song, they sang this song as my sacrifice uh, before God, that I will offer my life as a sacrifice to Him. But truly, truly, when the, when the writer wrote this song, it was more a longing for God to act and a desire for Abba to help him, uh, help her through the difficult seasons. And so as I offer this hymn, uh, with my terrible voice, I ask that you will reflect upon your own journey and make your own response to God. I will do it in English and I will do it in Mandarin. Now把这首诗歌献给神的时候呢，我请我请你们大家用你们的心去，也把自己的心也交给神，无论你在如何的困境。my heart longs for you my savior i would follow you my lord your kindness and love are vast as the sky your faithfulness never dies God and my King, your great name I sing, my offering of praise I bring. Jesus, oh Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, oh Jesus, I give you my life. 
my soul contemplates your glory. I worship in holy awe, in quietness and in confident trust. I rest in all that you are. And remember, in the midst of the difficult time, that in quietness and confidence, in confident trust, I rest in all that Abba is. I'll sing to the world your glory and grace until I behold your face. We'll sing tie tie ke mu yi zu. Yao 献上我的赞美耶稣我完全相信直到我见你面。So Father, we come before you this morning. May the words of the psalmist, Father, be hidden in our hearts. That as we go through difficult seasons in life, that together with the psalmist, Father, we will praise you. We will encourage ourselves in the midst of your silence. And we will find hope and courage. And recall the times of your faithfulness. Because you have been faithful in our times past. And so we trust, Father, that you will be faithful with us. And we will continue to offer our praise before you. As we wait on your sovereign works to reveal your glory and your goodness. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, whom we trust, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, we offer all this to you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Cam. Do all stand for the and complaint. Father, uh, thank you so much for who you are. Lord, well, we repent for you are still pant for the water. So our soul will be satisfied. Lord, well, help us to know that even though there are times of silence, yet you are active and we just need to hear your voice.
thank you for your challenge today. We pray that you will continue to draw us close to yourself. Because Lord, we know that you desire to be intimate with us. So Lord, may this be the journey of our heart also. And we, as we go through difficult times, to realize that you are there with us. Because you promise never to leave nor forsake us. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, 